Thank you, Jake. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And how are we doing on this wonderful, bright, and cheery day, Sunday morning? Great, great, great. You know it's great. All you do is look outside and the sun's shining and it's warm out there. Man, we can't help but feel great. Um, announcements for this week. Uh, Bible study, Wednesday at 6.30. Food pantry, Thursday at 10 till 2. And family day service and picnic will be held on May 16th at the cemetery property, the church property. We will not have Sunday school, and the service will begin at 10.45 and a picnic lunch to follow. Wow. And if it's a day like today, man, we're going to have a good time. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Please make plans to attend and invite your family. And don't forget your lawn chairs because the grass sometimes and the ground sometimes can be hard. And nobody wants to stand for a few hours. Oh, choir practice at four. And the food pantry is no longer doing appointments. Anybody can come on Thursday between 10 and 2. Okay, food pantry are not, is not doing appointments, so anybody can come between 10 and 2 o'clock on Thursday. Anything else? Rev. Bev, would you open with a word of prayer, please? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for all your blessings. We thank you for the freedom, the blessing of freedom to come together and worship as your people. Uh, Father, that no one is checking to see uh, who worships and how we worship, but that we are still free to worship as we see fit. Now, Father, we ask you to be present with us and may everything that's said and done, every song, every prayer, every word spoken, may it all be to your honor and glory and for the blessing and uplifting of your people. But we ask all these things in the name of the Christ. Amen. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, let's all stand and sing number 57, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Cooper, Becky Crosby, Helen Durden, Brenda Howe, Barbara Knight, Merlene Gay Lackey, James Lewis, Jim Moore, Wes Moy, Tommy and Deborah Shepard, 
Mary Helen Tapley, Billy Thomas, Lynn Thomas, Burnett Watson, Johnny Webb, Willie Mae Webb, Ryan Davis Wicker, Nancy Willis, Kelly Wilson, Jean Yates, and Jeanette Fulford. Short term is Jalen Franks, Sarah Galtney, Emma Ruth Savage, and Greg Edge. Family of David Jones, Debbie Coffer, Jimmy Passmore. Is there any other names we need to add to this list this morning? Anyone else? The family of Robert Gregory Sr. Robert Gregory Sr. Family of? Anyone else? Unspoken. Unspoken, okay. Beth, would you want to say a prayer, please? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you this morning for every answer we've seen for prayers. Lord, we come to you every week and we, we lift up more names. And Lord, we don't want to be taken for granted those who've seen answers to our prayers, those who have been blessed to be back to their wanted health, and Lord, even those who've gone on to glory. So we just pray, Father, this morning that you would accept our gratitude, even as we lift up these, these new names and these names that are chronically ill that Lord we're just concerned about and we want we want them to know that we love them and want them to feel your presence and know that they've not been forgotten that their church and their God realize who they are and what their needs are now Father we pray for our country for our leaders for those, Father, that whether it's in Washington or Atlanta or Dublin or East Dublin, wherever these leaders are, that, Father, you would give them the wisdom and the integrity to govern for the people who put them in office. Now, Father, we pray that we don't have to. Father, forgive us when we fail you, whether it's out of stubborn will or disobedience or, Father, just out of neglect. We pray you to forgive us and set us back on the right path that we would listen for that, for that Holy Spirit to tell us do this or don't go there. So Lord, we just pray that you would restore us to full communion with you. 
that we would be blessed to be in your presence. All this we pray in the name of the Christ. Amen.
Jake. Okay. Our reading this morning comes from John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the, others, the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his sight, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So that you might believe. If I had a subtitle for today's sermon, I might call it the panic room. And it has nothing to do with COVID-19 or economic politics. We're talking about fear. In 1947, Vladimir Zinchenkov, a government accounting clerk in Russia, returned home from a night of drinking to discover he had misplaced 400 ration cards owned by his boss. This was not a good thing. Ration cards were a prized commodity in post-war Russia. With Siberia causing, calling his name, Mrs. Zinchenkov advised her husband to make himself scarce. The next day, she told his co-workers that he had run off with another woman. For the next 22 years, according to newspaper reports, the terrified Mr. Zinchenkov never once left his house. In 1969, Mrs. Zinchenkov died and her husband went to the local police station to turn himself in. He was told that the ration cards had turned up in his desk drawer the day after he disappeared in 1947. <laughs> it's amazing what fear will do to us, isn't it? Prior to her death in 2002, advice columnist Ann Landers was said to have received over 10,000 letters a day. Once asked what was the most common problem people wrote to her about, without hesitation, she said, fear. Fear comes in many forms. Louis Pasteur is said to have had such an irrational fear of dirt and infection that he refused to shake hands. President and Mrs. Benjamin Harrison were so intimidated by the newfangled electricity installed in the White House, they didn't dare touch the switches. So if there were no servants around to turn off the lights when the Harrisons went to bed, they slept with the lights on. <coughs> Philip McGraw, 
popularly known as Dr. Phil on his daily talk show, helps people get their lives together. Our everyday choices, he says, separate the sane and successful from the frustrated and failing. The important thing to understand, he concludes, is that the number one catalyst in the choices we make is fear. It's true. The number one problem that causes many of us to make wrong choices is that we're afraid. Afraid of what our friends will think, afraid of ridicule, afraid of failing, afraid of being hurt. Even the disciples of Jesus gave in to fear. Donald Tuttle, pastor from Corpus Christi, Texas, began a sermon on today's text in a novel way. He uh, drew a parallel between the uh, text today and a motion picture that came out a number of years back starring Jodie Foster. The movie was The Panic Room. Foster played a a recently divorced woman who was pleased to find a brownstone apartment in New York City for her and her daughter. It was to be a place from which they would begin to rebuild their lives. But their joy turned to terror when three thugs broke in to their new home. They were seeking millions of dollars supposedly hidden there by the former owner. So to escape, the woman and her daughter retreated to the home's one unique feature, a self-contained concrete room, the panic room. Now, the panic room features a steel door which can't be penetrated, video monitors, and a loudspeaker system. Their intention was simple. They would hunker down in safety until the robbers went away. Now, of course, there's a lot more to the story, but what the woman and her daughter first intended is pretty much what Jesus' disciples did after his crucifixion. Fearing the same people that had arrested, convicted, and crucified their Lord, they retreated to their own panic room, to the safety of a home where they could close and bar the door. They probably figured they would hunker down for a while, wait out the danger, and then when the uproar was over, they'd slip back out of Jerusalem and go back to their old lives, back to the way things used to be. If the risen Christ had not appeared to these frightened disciples behind those closed doors and calmed their fears, you have to wonder whether they would ever have amounted to anything. They were down, discouraged, disillusioned, doubting. Even though some of them had already encountered the risen Christ, they were still in shock, stunned by the events of the preceding days. And the last thing they expected was that this would be the day that Jesus Christ himself would offer peace to replace their fear. It began when Christ made himself real to them. There they were with the doors locked in fear when Christ suddenly came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So was he greeting them with a blessing, Peace be with you? Or was he trying to calm them down? Peace be with you. Much as we might croon easy, it's going to be okay to a frightened child. There's not much Jesus could do with these disciples while they were still shivering in shadows then we know that Jesus' second most common command was to love. What was his first? Don't be afraid. But they were afraid. It was just all too much for them. So what did Jesus do? He said to them, Peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. He wanted them to know that it was really him. Jesus tells us that the Disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Here's the importance of his showing them his hands and his side. The greatest problem that the disciples had was the greatest problem that you and I have. was a lack of faith. What is fear? It's a lack of faith. 
faith in ourselves, maybe faith in others, but ultimately it's a lack of faith in God. If we were able to completely trust God and God's love for us, couldn't we handle anything that comes our way? Rollo May was a famous therapist and author of the 20th century. And among his books is one called My Quest for Beauty. And it tells of his lifelong search for beauty. And among the experiences he talks about is a visit to Mount Athos, a peninsula of Greece inhabited exclusively by monks. May was in the early stages of recovering from a nervous breakdown when he visited Mount Athos. And he happened to arrive just as the monks were celebrating Greek Orthodox Easter, a ceremony thick with symbolism, thick with beauty. Icons were everywhere, incense hung in the air. And at the height of the service, the priest gave everyone present three Easter eggs wonderfully decorated and wrapped in a veil. Christos Anesti, he said. Christ is risen. And each person there, including Rollo May, responded according to custom. He is risen indeed. Now here's what in, what's interesting. Rollo May was not a believer. But he writes in his book, I was seized then by a moment of spiritual reality. What would it mean for our world, he asked, if he had truly risen? Now the answer to his question is easy. No longer would you and I be afraid. If we knew without a doubt in the world that Jesus had risen from the dead, we would fear nothing. Death? Are you kidding me? Death is the entrance to God's glory. If we're a disciple of Jesus, the day of our dying ought to be the happiest day of our life. Do you believe that? Well, yes, that's easy to say, but we're not much different from those disciples. On Easter Sunday night, we believe it, but there's a part of us that's still uncertain and doubting. Our text contains the story of doubting Thomas. Well, you know, Thomas has many contemporary friends. How many of us spend much of our time uh, and a lot of our lives worrying about finances, worrying about our health, worrying about our loved ones, worrying about what people think of us, worrying about whether they think of us at all? Or if we're not worried, we're worrying that we're missing something. My dad was a champion. If he didn't have something to worry about, he was worried he'd miss something. So <clears throat> if we could only trust our lives to God, if we could truly believe that Christ really did rise from the grave, if we could believe that our lives are in God's hands and that God loves us more than we love our own children, then there's no limit to what God might be able to do for us and through us. Jesus appeared to the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. And then knowing how much their hearts needed reassurance, he repeated himself and again said, Peace be with you. When my son came, first came home out of the Air Force, he worked for a while as a house parent at Methodist Children's Home in Macon. And among his young charges was a boy who'd been abandoned with his sister uh, on a farm in the country when their adopted parents divorced and both left without the children. Now, the boys weren't allowed to bring food from the dining hall back to their cottage, but the house parents made regular rounds in the mornings after the boys went to school and they were always finding in this little boy's space food under the bed, hidden in the dresser drawers, food in the closet, uh, you know, and, and of course they didn't want that because of bugs and all that kind of stuff, but he constantly had food 
hidden in his room. He was filled with fear that there would never be enough. Enough food, enough love, enough security. He hoarded every bit of food he could just in case he couldn't trust the adults to take care of him. And we understand why. How sad and yet how very much like us. Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread. He taught us not to look ahead to the next day's cares and concerns. They would take care of themselves. But to focus on today and to trust God. But some of us can't do that. Why? Because deep down we're like that child at the Methodist home. Never enough material resources, never enough love, never enough security. We're afraid. And friends, the meaning of Christ showing the disciples his hands and his side that it is that it doesn't have to be that way. As someone has said, the presence of fear is a sure sign that we're trusting in our own strength. When will we quit hoarding life and start trusting life to our loving Heavenly Father? Christ said a second time, peace be with you. And then he added, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why did they need the Holy Spirit? Well, because Jesus would no longer be with them physically. There would be days and weeks and months and years when he would not be able to reassure them by showing them his hands and sides. They would need to depend on the Holy Spirit, Christ's Spirit at work in the world. And he knew this wouldn't be easy for them. There would be days when they would face unbelievable hardship and persecution. And without the assurance of Christ's Holy Spirit, they simply would not make it. And that's true for us as well. We believe in Christ. Each year we celebrate the resurrection and yet we still live such timid, tentative lives. We need to pray constantly that Christ's Spirit will be as real to us as it was to them. And it was real to them. Look at what happened. They went from being fearful, hiding in that upper room, to being some of the most daring people who've ever walked this earth. Ridicule couldn't slow them down. Torture and threats of death couldn't stop them. They answered Rollo May's question, what would it mean for our world if he truly had risen? By the way they lived, nothing could stop them. And that's why more than one billion people on this planet today bow at the name of Jesus. Their terror turned to trusting. Their fear was replaced by faith. They left the panic room to plant the gospel in every corner of the world. Now the question is, what could you and I do if we truly believe that Christ has risen from the dead? Can we make a difference in our world? Can we become more loving, more daring, more dramatic in how we carry the cross of Christ? Bette Midler sang a song years ago that struck a chord with many. It's the heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. It's the dream afraid of waking that never takes a chance. It's the one who won't be taken, who cannot seem to give. And the soul afraid of dying that never learns to live. Is that where you are right now? Are you the soul afraid of dying that never learns to live? Are you hiding in your own spiritual panic room? Christ can come into any room if you'll let him. Christ can give you his peace. He can breathe into you his spirit. He can and will empower you to speak to that neighbor or friend, to minister to that one in need, but will you let him? Don't let any more of life pass you by. Christ is alive, 
and there is nothing in heaven or on earth that we need ever fear again. As we transition to our celebration of Holy Communion this morning, I invite you, if you have a need for more peace, for more courage, for more sense of God's presence, to come to the altar and spend some time there after you've, gotten, after you've taken Holy Communion. And just let God know your need. Amen and amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. Gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
body of Christ given for you, Cindy. Would we all stand and sing our closing hymn, Where He Leads, number 338.
I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. And go with me, with me all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he May the grace of God our Father, the love of Christ his Son, and the communion of the sweet Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and equip you for another week of ministry. For it's in the name of the Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you. Love one another.